Hello and good evening, everyone. I hope you had a great day and are ready to learn a bit more, but also have some questions that you would like to get some answers for. And this is Caroline. I'm your host, and I'm very happy to be back with uh, one of our um, fertility specialists. As you can see, Dr. Christos Rukudis is right here with us. Hello, uh, Dr. Christos. I'm glad that you are here. Thanks so much for uh, joining us tonight and for agreeing to present this particular topic. How have you been? All good, I hope. Fine. Hello, Caroline. Thank you for having me. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you for being again a part of our very, very nice and exciting project. And I'm doing fine. How are you? Happy that I'm here and I'm glad that we are able to talk about this uh, particular talk. As I've mentioned, as you know, it's should you do PGTA for your egg donation uh, treatment. So this is definitely a question that we will uh, try to answer, of course, tonight, but also uh, Dr. Christos will talk about PGTA in general, so you will be able to have a look at this. And as always, remember that this is going to be recorded. And if you have any questions, all you need to do is just to type those in the chat section. Dr. Christos will answer them for you right after his presentation. And uh, I do believe it's going to be very, very interesting session. So remember that if you have anything uh, you would like to share, again, you can type those in the chat section. If there's anyone here that would like to get in touch with Dr. Christus and his team at IVF Life in Alicante, of course, there is also a possibility. So don't forget, it's it's always, uh, I guess it's always better even to, to have a consultation one-on-one -on -one. That way you can get even more details. I know doctors always need more details from you in order to properly answer. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, ask anything you wish, of course, to, to get some information on. And let me just mention uh, before we start with our presentation that my IV offenses, we are part of European Fertility Society and uh, our webinars are brought to you, our patients. We simply want to help you out those are always free of charge webinars and we are here to educate, help in any way we possibly can. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I believe it will be very useful for you. And yeah, let's not waste any more time and let's get going with our presentation. Okay, Dr. Christos, ready? We'll do our best. Perfect. Thank you so much then. So again, um... Good evening to all. My name is Dr. Chris Rakoudis. I'm one of the gynecologists at IVF Life. Um, together, we will speak about um, a very interesting topic. It's very simple. In the end, it's if it's useful to do a PGTA testing if um, you are doing a donation. Um, it's uh, slightly different than doing it in with your with your own eggs. And here we're going to speak about. Um, the details and if it's something that should be performed or not. Okay, let's start right away. We start with the basic stuff. Um, what is pre-implantation genetic screening or PGTA? So pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidies. It's a test for chromosome copy numbers that can be used during uh, IVF to help determine the chromosomal status of an embryo from a biopsy of one of or more cells. The results of these tests can aid in the selection of an embryo um, that likely has a number of normal, a normal number of chromosomes, so called oiploid, for a transfer to help avoid all the ones that are up, have abnormal number of chromosomes called aneuploid that may result in a higher tendency of an IVF failure or a miscarriage, then we will uh, um, start with our favorite uh, subject, and biology and genetics. We know that uh, during the embryo development in the uterus of the, of our mother, um, if we have, if we speak especially for a female embryo, um, all the eggs, all the oocytes are created. Already then, the number starts to decrease and at birth, they drop significantly. Starting with the puberty, you can see here all this with the graphic, uh, certain cohort of oocytes 
are always recruited and only one always wins the race and becomes dominant. So here we see this significant loss. And um, also with increasing age, uh, we don't only have the loss in the amount of the eggs, we have also a loss in the quality of the eggs because those oocytes, they accompany um, women during her reproductive life and also are vulnerable to damage in the DNA that they possess. This is one reason why uh, it's so difficult to have success with their, with their own eggs in an advanced reproductive uh, stage. Here, um, um, we can see chromosome pairs. We know that every cell that we have, that we possess, have, uh, has 22 chromosome pairs. And depending on the gender, we have an additional XX uh, copy, or, or if it's a, a male, uh, it's an XY. Uh, in order for a healthy child to be born with a normal number of chromosomes, the eggs available for a fertilization must have undergone a process of um, producing or having only one copy of each chromosome. So this process, it's called meiosis. Um, a similar process occurs in the sperm of the male. The result is that the new life that is created possess 50% of the chromosomes of each partner. What we see above is something that is much more common in older oocytes to occur. So in, uh, what I mean is with advanced reproductive age, that this meiosis process is disturbed and the oocytes um, that are created have uh, additional copies of the one that we see here, or they don't have any. So um, progressing age has also here um, um, an influence. And um, also this lack of integrity in the oocytes can result to, in the end, to unhealthy embryos that will not implant or can lead to an early miscarriage before, normally before of the age of the week 12 and less often in the, uh, in a, can result in an unhealthy uh, child. We can see here, for example, how this risk is significantly uh, increased with uh, increasing maternal age. We see that Down syndrome, Edward syndrome, all of those are much like, uh, likely to happen in comparison to uh, younger age. So what do we have? We have the pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. Uh, this test was suggested as a tool to identify those unhealthy embryos here we can see on this picture the trisomy uh, 21, so uh, Down syndrome. And this PGTA testing in the form that we have right now um, has become a routine add-on for IVF to determine whether human embryos are to be clinically utilized or disposed of. Um, the idea is that prior to an embryo transfer into the uterus, um, to rule out the aneuploid embryos and work only with the, with the healthy ones, so to increase the um, success rates. Um, what you can see here is a time scale of important events between the late 90s and now. We can see, for example, here is the single polar biopsy. Uh, here is uh, the biopsy of the first and the second polar body. Here the biopsy later on day three, so on the morula stage, on the clivet stage. Um, this is a blastocyst. And here is the stage, this is the PGTA, where we perform um, the PGTA testing.
for you to see it a little bit better, you see here how the embryo will, how a fertilized egg and then an embryo will further develop, give us a morula on day three, on day five, day six. Uh, we're going to have the blastocyst ready to perform the, the biopsy, the PGTA. Here we can see the process a little bit more in detail. Uh, first, we have to perform the stimulation to obtain as many oocytes as possible. When the follicles reach to a certain size, we do the egg retrieval. Uh, once, once we have the oocytes in the laboratory, um, the fertilization follows, the, egg will, the embryos will then start to develop. And on day five, we're going to perform the PGTA analysis. Uh, and right away, we're going to freeze the embryos then, waiting for the results. These results take almost three weeks. One second. So here you can see how the PGTA test is performed. Um, our biologists take around six, seven cells from the cells that are gonna fall. It's gonna form the future placenta, and called trophoectoderm, and um, we analyze it in our lab. When we finally have the analysis from the technique that called uh, next generation sequencing, we can see. Uh, if and at which chromosome pair an extra chromosome or maybe a loss is present. Here, for example, it's chromosome 13. Here we, you can see that we performed uh, PGT analysis to several embryos. We did an IVF cycle, obtained uh, a good amount of embryos and data the analysis. Um, so you can see that many embryos are abnormal and so they are not suited for a transfer. And, and out of those five embryos, only one is normal. Um, the proposed threshold, you can see here a few um, classifications like normal, mosaic, abnormal. Uh, this gives us an information about the amount of unhealthy DNA. Normal is if an haploid DNA in a single biopsy is less than 20%. Mosaic, I will um, explain it a little bit later. Uh, if the, this unhaploid DNA in this single biopsy is between 20 and 30% and unhaploid, if the unhaploid DNA is more than 80%. Okay, let's leave the topic of PGTA testing for a moment and move on to ectonation. For women with uh, exhausted oocyte reserve and the probability uh, of fulfilling the desire to have a child with their own oocytes is very difficult. So ectonation is the option that can lead us to our goal in the end. It's a treatment with a very, very high success rate. So the pregnancy rates are around um, 75% with the first attempt in our clinic and the life birth rate is a little bit less. The reason for that is that donors are very, very young and therefore have the best oocyte quality. Also, we do some tests prior to the treatment, prior to select um, a donor. And this is uh, very important, a mapping of their own chromosomes. Uh, to see if they have a higher tendency of producing unhealthy embryos. This factor allows us to have success rates that are very, very high. They are the success rate um, of the time span between 20 and 25 years old. So um, a public, this is from a publication from 2007 from the UK, and you can see that in the statistics that the how the um, how the life birth rate decrease 
decreases with uh, the advance of the eggs and therefore conclude how important healthy eggs are for success. Especially we see here in this area that it's extremely, extremely difficult to have success with your own eggs. On this statistic, um, regarding the PGTA testing, this is from a publication of 2016 uh, from a study from the States, a big study. We can see that from the PGTA testing, in certain groups, we have a benefit. Um, so patients with advanced reproductive age and a certain collective may have a benefit. If you compare now the two statistics that I showed you, and we we'll look at the whole picture, the whole thing, we can see that at a young age, the age of the donors between 20, 25, we have no significant damage, uh, adva advantage with a PGTA testing, rather the opposite, the same is true when PGTA testing is performed unselected in each couple. You see here that the live birth rate is high. So women have the success rate, as I mentioned before, of the donors. Things getting a little bit more complicated because uh, PGTA testing is rather a matter of debate. Um, some thoughts. Um, mosaicism, what I mentioned before, that a certain amount of DNA in the cell is not okay, um, is frequently, frequently found in pre implantation stage embryos. And it seems like that it represents a normal physiological finding at those stages. So chromosomal abnormal embryos may self-correct downstream, downstream. This explains also the persistence of chromosomal abnormal cells in placentas of healthy babies. Um, one other thing that is criticized is that the average five, six, seven cell trophoectoderm biopsy that we perform um, cannot define 100% the state of an embryo, if it's if the embryo is obloid or unobloid. And also um, something that we are not 100% sure about it is the impact of damage that it's caused from a biopsy, because human embryos are sensitive to manipulation and biopsy. Um, in addition, what you see here at my um, at your screen, is that several case reports surfaced showing that embryos tested as mosaic, but in some cases also as unemployed, resulted in healthy babies. So we have a high, so also a false positive rate. This means that this test can show us that the embryo is unhealthy or not suited for a transfer, but in reality, he's suited. So consequently, uh, one must conclude that large number of false positive embryos are either not used in a treatment, maintained in cryopreservation, or even get discards. So it's also a mother, it's also an ethical problem. Um, one study that I always like to mention, it's one of my favorites actually, this is the STAR trial. This um, STAR stands for Single Embryo Transfer of an Uploid Embryo. It was a multi-centric study. Uh, included four countries, if I remember correctly, um, several centers. Uh, it, was, it was one of the largest that was undertaken. Um, and it included 650 subjects, and they were randomized. Um, this showed us so the main goal was to, um, the primary outcome of the study was the ongoing pregnancy rate um, after 
uh, the uh, 20th, 20th week of pregnancy. And um, what we saw was that um, the uh, ongoing survival rate was not extremely higher, regardless if uh, PGTA testing was performed or not. Um, but what you can see on this image is that a certain patient group would benefit out of it. It was the, pers the, the group of 35 to 40 where had benefit out of this treatment because the ongoing live birth rate was quite it was much higher. Um, when the PGTA testing was performed in all ages, it didn't show such a big benefit. And when uh, it was performed uh, in the younger ages, what is our topic for today? So that's the, the topic, the, the age of our donors. We didn't have a benefit at, at all. Um, maybe the achieved the opposite to have maybe also decreased um, rates of uh, success. So um, it's very, very important to see the big picture. Um, now I want to share with you a few general thoughts and those general thoughts are the conclusions. PGTA testing should, um, PGTA testing, um, offers benefits when it used properly. However, something that we must not forget, not all couples benefit from it. The patient should have an increased reproductive age at least and produced, produced uh, as multiple embryos. Um, we must take also in account that every time it must be an individual decision. We must take in account all the factors of the couple. For example, do, we, do this couple face uh, multiple implantation failures, miscarriages? So then we speak about a certain patient group that could benefit out of the PGTA testing. And um, at last, um, since um, patients have with egg donation the life birth rate of the donor, so they have the life birth rate that they had with 20, with 25, um, PGK testing doesn't make a big difference. And it could be most likely also counterproductive in the end because of the false positive results. And also uh, a matter of debate is, of course, the ethical dilemma that appears that I mentioned before. One exception could be um, couples where in the karyotype of the husband are some findings that could lead to a higher tendency of producing unhealthy embryos. And with this slide, I come to the end, to an end. Um, here you can see all the clinics of the IVF Life Group. And I'm part of the, the, the team in Alicante where the headquarters are. And um, I'm here to thank you for your attention first, and I'm here to answer all of your questions and also um, um, to gladly give you any advice in uh, your personal cause if you um, desire a second opinion. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Christos, for presenting and, of course, explaining all the details about PGTA. And right now, you are very right. It's time for your questions. Anything you would like to share, any comments, any questions, go ahead, type those in, and Dr. Christos will definitely help you out with any of those. Uh, but, however, if you wish to get some more details, as always, remember, as you can see on the screen, there is this contact at ivfspain.com. Uh, email address. You can always use it and get in touch with the team. I'm sure they will be happy to help you out.
with even more, of course, as well. And there is one question here already from Derek. Let's have a look at this. Okay. So what are your thoughts on donor egg using PGTA, et cetera, versus Mito score and or MF? Not sure here. Sorry. Um, I don't know for what it stands, the MF. Okay. Uh, uh, Derek, if you can clarify. Okay. So uh, as I said before, um, PGTA test, egg donation give us a very, very high success rate on its own. So with, um, there is no significant benefit out of uh, PGTA testing in donor eggs. Male factor, what you mentioned before, and this is what I, what I mentioned in the end, um, if we have like a male factor, um, this could, it's not always um, possible to recognize exactly what's, for example, the microdilatation in the karyotype, some minor abnormalities that seems to be minor, but can uh, lead to a higher tendency of producing unhealthy eggs. There, yes, maybe PGTA testing could help us a little bit out. Thank you so much for the very first question, Derek. And thank you for helping out with this. And let me have a look. Of course, there's a thank you from Derek and Sebastian you, has another question. What about increased male age as an indication for PGT? Not really, not really, because um, it, it sounds a, bit, a little bit mean. I don't want to say it like this, but sperms that come out of the fabric, you know, every three months. So um, if the karyotype is okay, um, it's not a strict indication to do PGTA testing because uh, of uh, higher um, male age, to be honest. There is no data about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for clarification. Uh, interesting question indeed, of course. Uh, yes, I've seen mm -hmm. many, many times before, of course, as well. And someone is typing, we need to give it a minute. And while we are waiting, I have some... Uh, other question, actually, if you can tell us, because so recently we had a webinar also where it was mentioned, non-invasive PGTA. It's something that is starting to appear, let's say, at the clinics. If I just may ask, do, are you doing any trials so far or not yet, at least? We are, we are on it, especially if we want to take in account, you know, not to harm an embryo, because this is what I mentioned before. We don't know exactly to which extent... Um, this harm that we do the, bio, the biopsy can shrink the potential of the embryo. We don't know exactly. The first studies, they point to the direction that it's not so much. It's not so much, and it's not the, the reason for a miscarriage or a failure. But they can't be 100% sure because we know that cells, um, they are developing, they're dividing on an axis, an axis of development. And nobody can be 100% sure if those cells are belonging to this axis of development, are on those and on this precise axis of development. And if we take these cells away, we don't know exactly what would be the impact. With this um, liquid PGTA, what you mentioned, Caroline, uh, there is potential. There is potential, but something that concerns me is the false positive results. Because um, Let's say we have a couple uh, that is like, now I don't speak about ectonation, I speak about PGTA testing, liquid PGTA testing, and they produce me only one embryo. One embryo, I do this liquid, and because of false positive result, I will discard the embryo because I can't transfer, also because of low reasons and everything. So it can backfire to us. So it must be reliable. All of those tests must be 100% or close to 100% reliable to use them to use them in the in, as a, in a routine. Okay, makes perfect sense indeed. And of course, thank you for answering that additional question. Uh, makes perfect sense indeed. Um, so. Let's have a look what questions are coming in. Uh, does IVF Spain offer a 100% money back guarantee program for the IVF egg donation? Um, this is something that you must speak with our team because they're, you know, um, more aware of the whole um, financial things, the programs, and we are, and I'm happy for that also. 
Yeah, because I can, it leaves me enough space to concentrate only on the medical part. Of course, that's understandable. I will put you put um, an email address, direct email address you can get in touch with. Uh, I think uh, contact at ivfspain.com, mm -hmm. right? That's the one. Okay, you can uh, have a look and you can get in touch directly with the team. I'm sure they will be happy to answer. Sorry, that. sorry that I couldn't answer. It's you. okay, perfectly okay, of course. Uh, I'm sure yeah. they will be even able to help you out with the prices, etc. So I you don't want to hear it from me, you know, I'm, <laughs> I will mess it up for sure. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Then. Uh, not a problem at all. And the question we have again from Derek here, what are your thoughts on CRI, SPR, sorry, not sure about this one and prior to PGTA? No, for, for me, it would not make any sense to do it prior. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because also the results are not like, you know, so I would like to have a cardiotype before to see what the chromosomes are and that's it in the break to the start to see how the for the, for the male part, the chromosomes are, and this, uh, first of all, this is enough for me. Mm -hmm. And okay. so, something that I mentioned before, it's very, very important also to speak, to take the individual decision, to see what the couple have been through, what they have done before, everything. Okay, again, thank you so much. And there's a perfect... Uh, from Derek and thank you from our previous patient for well, answering well, the well, question. Well. Jennifer has another question. Is it better to get a donor egg having the same blood type as myself? No. Um, there are plenty of investigation also in this field. The, um, the blood group doesn't play a role. Uh, the only reason is if you want to keep it a secret, you know, uh, because technically uh, uh, your children could find out through the blood group if his or her blood group doesn't shoot with uh, uh, with uh, from with yours and your you know the blood group of your husband, and um, but for the for the success of the treatment it doesn't play a role at all. All right, again, thank you so much. Definitely interesting and something to think about for sure as well. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Uh, now we have a, another question with some details here from Emma. So far, we have had five failed transfers with own egg IVF and one miscarriage. We should recently tried donor egg with one excellent and good blastocyst, which failed. When we try donor egg IVF again, would you use PGTA testing to check for implantation failure or the donor round was just bad luck? We have a five-year-old child conceived naturally. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is, for example, a case where I must look into details. I must look, for example, if there's any other reason for the miscarriages. Uh, the genetic integrity of an embryo is a very important reason, but we have also other reasons, you know, the womb, the, the uterus, uh, immunological deficiencies, celiac disease. There are many, many things. So um, first of all, we need to do a homework to see what happens with all of those things to to uh, to make a check you know after all of them uh pgt i don't think that the pgta testing would be in our in your situation like the big uh, game changer uh from what i see because um you have already proved that you have that you can conceive that you can have a baby and, uh, and can and can have um a uh, normal pregnancy. Uh, the only thing is that the PGTA we could have with the first attempt success. The cumulative rate is the same. Regardless if I have three embryos or two embryos, the cumulative rate is the same. But with the PGTA testing, we could have a little bit sooner success. Uh, but also this is what, as I told you before, a matter of debate in the end. Um, so I would first look, uh, have a look into the, all the history that you had so far. You can s feel free also to send the send your uh, file uh, to me to have a look, and I can tell you if I would do anything different. But uh, do not a mistake. Don't compare uh, your own trials with the egg donation, because most likely, I don't know exactly now your your story, but most likely uh, there were transfers in a more advanced reproductive age. So I doubt that you are 
that you did the transfers with 25. But okay. I, I would be happy to, to give you a second opinion. Of course. Thank you so much, Emma, for sharing. And uh, thank, thank you, you for your help. Uh, and as Dr. Christus mentioned, if you wish to get some more details, obviously he needs the whole uh, medical story history. Um, get in touch with the email address there that I put. And I'm sure you will be able to get even more uh, answers. Okay, someone again is typing. We need to wait a minute. And of course, there's a thank you from Emma for your help. And yeah, let's let's have a look. Okay, I need to wait and see. Uh, for example, the important that... would be to see the implantation window if you mm -hmm. haven't performed it, to see because if it was always negative, 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 it would be an, an uh, indication there uh, to do an investigation in the implantation window. You know, I'm a friend of doing things that make sense, you know. Um, so if the indication is there, we perform the diagnostic that must be performed. So, and then we see also a benefit. Okay, thank you uh, for adding that. And let's have a look. Another question. Any relation between egg donation failure and a celiac disease in terms of success? It is, yes. Um, this, um, there's a relation there because... Um, if somebody has celiac disease, he has also antibodies against glutamine. There's the anti-transglutaminase antibody and the anti-gliandine antibody. It was very easy for all for everybody to remember it. <laughs> Have you write it down? Um, so those antibodies, they are. If somebody has like a celiac disease. Um, they have those antibodies in their blood and those antibodies could attack the ongoing pregnancy. So uh, it could be regardless if you do like uh, egg donation or an IVF treatment with your own eggs, um, select disease could play a role. So um, to test for these antibodies, it's very easy. And the solution is much easier, you know, uh, to uh, take off um, uh, the, um, the gluten from your diet. Not fancy Excellent. thing, you know? Okay, to not to be able to eat pasta and pizza. Okay, now that I think about it, it's like... True. <laughs> Thank you so much. I uh, hope that was helpful. I do believe so, of course. Um, and right now, I don't see any questions. But of course, again, go ahead. Type those in if you have any left. If not, remember, as I've mentioned, you can always get in touch directly with the team and Dr. Christus as well. I'm sure they will be happy to help you out even more. Um, and there's also a thank you for your welcome. Welcome. Uh, help with the previous question here. And let's have a look. I don't want to end. I want to make sure that you've asked all the questions. If not, we will be finishing. But I'm uh, glad that you are asking all those different kind of questions. I believe it has been useful already. Um, and at least for now, it looks like that is our final question. But before we finish, um, Dr. Christus, anything else you would like to add? Anything at all that you still think about and wish to tell I think, patients. Um, one responsibility that we have as doctors is, especially when we work in this field, is um, to see that all the cases, individual, it's not like, okay, they had like several um, failed attempts with their own necks. Can we make a donation? This will be the solution. No, it's not like this. There's a reason for not having success. And Yes, the quality could be a reason, but there are plenty of other reasons. So we must do the investigation and not uh, have a repeat the same mistakes that or maybe were performed before and before. For example, endometriosis could play a role also in ectonation. So we need to, to, uh, um, to do the necessary steps to, so that the couple has the best, the best shot. So we have the means, we have the necessary tools. So um, we have a very high responsibility towards the patient and we must fulfill this role to, to our best. So ectonation, it's not, you know, the solution for everything. This Thank is what makes so the difference in the success in the end. 
Thank you so much for adding that. This is definitely something that I think many, many times is omitted, not really checked properly, I would say. And we've seen it. That's the truth. We've seen it many, many times already, and we've heard about it. So because thank you then for it causes that. much more trouble, much more, you know, uh, uh, how do you say? The couples are more upset in the end because they say, okay, we tried with, my, with the, our own ex, it's not a success. We tried with this donor ex, it's not a success. What's going on? So we have a very, very high responsibility here. Thank you. And well, Derek also added, I agree. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek, for coming in. I know that you've been with us a few times before, so I'm glad that you are back. And all of you, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for your questions. Uh, but also, I, I hope that it, was, it has been useful. And let me just mention that if you wish to have a look at this once again, there will be an option. You will be able to find this on our website, myivfenses.com. But also, if you go to our YouTube channel, you know there are over 400 20 webinars in English. They are also in Spanish and, and Italian, uh, but over 420 webinars available on our site. So plenty, plenty of um, amazing educative uh, webinars and you can definitely learn a lot more. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to mention that Dr. Christos will be back. There will be another webinar, I believe in May. I have to check though, <laughs> uh, but I'm glad that we are uh, going to see each other very soon and I'm sure it's going to be very useful for you as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Christos. Always a pleasure to have you here and uh, thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, yeah. Thank you, much. thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you. Um, thank you for your night, for your uh, for your great questions, and also giving me the opportunity uh, to share my knowledge with uh, with you. Thank you very much. And we are happy that you were able to uh, show this, and of course, share your experience as well. Thank you so much, indeed. Enjoy your evening, and we will see each other uh, very soon, Dr. Christus. And of course, as you know, we will be back with more webinars. Uh, there will be a new webinar coming up in two weeks' time, actually, also on Tuesday. So if you haven't signed up yet, go ahead, do it. And I'm already looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Dr. Christus. Everyone have a lovely Bye -bye. evening and see you very soon. Take care. Bye.